Okay, so um, I think some of you will have probably um, ha heard some of this talk before um, as I presented some early stages of the work at the FAME Forum. Um, the evaluations project itself um, is designed as a two-stage project and I'm going to be talking about stage one, evals one. Um, it was designed as a project to develop and implement strategic improvements in practice uh, of archaeological evaluation in England, very specifically, and, uh, so, <laughs> and focusing on um, intrusive evaluation only. So, um, so there are lots of things that I'm not going to talk about, but obviously we appreciate that they're part of the process of evaluation. Uh, it was initially envisaged as an exercise in preparing up-to-date guidance on sample sizes by collecting uh, reliable peer-reviewed information. Um, and the aim is basically to try and ensure that evaluation is sufficient, cost-effective and proportionate. And the specific aims of EVALS 1 were to uh, determine what factors we think are most important in designing those strategies, encourage wider recognition within um, our, effectively our client base as to the value of archaeological evaluation, and as I said, to strengthen the evidence base so that we could look at uh, sector-wide strategic improvements. The data has been gathered through a variety of methods. We started off with four workshops, each workshop focused on a particular sector. Um, so uh, there were, in the end, there were two heritage-focused workshops, uh, one for uh, residential clients and um, residential infrastructure, minerals extraction, and I've missed one of them. No, that was it. <laughs> and. Um, and then we had a fifth workshop where uh, the results have been presented back and people have got to comment on those. Um, we also looked to get together some case studies, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but uh, that was a key part of the follow-on from those workshops. And partly because of the shortcomings with the case study information, as I said, I'll come on to that in a second, we've now also conducted a series of uh, interviews with specific representatives from the different sectors just to pick up on some of the points that were brought out in the workshops. And um, there's also been a review of some of the literature. And again, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and we've had a, a knowledge hub on the Historic England uh, forum. So some of the discussion, particularly around the early workshops, has also taken place on there. Now, I'm going to emphasize that the data I'm presenting here is as it was received in those workshops. It represents a wide variety of opinions from the whole variety of stakeholders. And no one voice in what I'm presenting here is speaking louder than any others. I think it's important to emphasize that because inevitably, when we're talking about encouraging improvement and change, it's going to be contentious. And some of the dis discussions have brought out some of our sort of sexual sensitivities in that respect. But positive outcomes are definitely possible out of this. And it's important, important to recognise that many of the issues that we're talking about being encountered within the planning process are not unique to archaeology. And one of the final interviews, which has been with a, a representative from the uh, planning bodies, has very much uh, emphasised that. The views expressed here are, um, they reflect the opinions expressed by heritage professionals, clients and other stakeholders. They're not a criticism of any particular group, and they must not be read as such, uh, but they do constitute a summary of the issues that we're encountering currently. And um, there'll be a report, I'll, come, I'll, I'll explain a bit more about what's happening next at the end, but there's a report coming out, and in that report, obviously I've got more room to discuss those, uh, to explain where those opinions have come from. But wherever there's a difference between sectors, that's kind of drawn out and explained a bit more. So where are the opinions coming from? Well, as I said, we had the uh, five workshops in the end. And at those workshops, we had a total of 86 people attend. They were held online. Um, obviously, this, this work's been going on over the last 18 months. So, um, There were 32 local authority archaeological advisors, 19 archaeological contractors, 18 consultants, 10 client representatives, and three representatives from um, professional bodies such as Historic England plus four people who I don't know where they would fit. <laughs> um, so we've got a very broad audience uh, attending. And those workshops specifically looked at four separate questions. 
I'm not going to go into great detail about them, but effectively those questions just looked at different uh, areas with, within the uh, discussion of strategy. So we looked at strategy, what we thought the main issues were, um, how we could deliver better to our clients, and indeed what clients we should be delivering to, whether that was the public or the, or the uh, developers. And then what things, the top three things that we might do going forwards. Um, what was interesting from my point of view was it was a real consistency in the opinion that we were getting from all of the different groups and um, sometimes quite surprising consistency. Uh, there was a general consensus that we do need to change some things um, and a willingness that to, to do that and to create a much um, more easily understood and transparent process. And the evidence from the workshops showed that the biggest areas, areas of concern actually related to inter and cross sector communication, the clarity of the methods that we're using and providing an early understanding of what the scope of works might be. Um, in the more detailed report, I'm, I, I present a table of all of the collated answers that shows how, how between the different workshops we had consistency and difference. Uh, but there's, there's not as much time to, put, to go into detail on that here today. So I'm just going to show you a word cloud that was created just using the notes that were taken from the workshops. So these are the key themes that were being drawn out. And, uh, obviously, <laughs> um, there's, there's, there's one that's showing up particularly um, in, in bold there. Um, the, the idea had been that the case studies would, would provide us more information on what's actually being done in terms of percentage covering for eva coverage for evaluation and the de decisions behind that. In the end, the case studies that we came in, there, there isn't sufficient data in it to do anything statistically significant with that. I'm not going to pretend that there is. Um, we did get some interesting uh, results out of it, and it kind of gives us a bit of a snapshot of what's going on at the moment. Um, there was a fairly reasonable geographic and sectoral spread in the case studies, but more of them came in from the minerals sector than any other group, which I think is a reflection of how um, important this issue currently is in that, in that group. Um, as I said, there's no statistically valid conclusions that I can make from this data, but um, what they show us in summary is that uh, there's a huge variety of the proportion of a project budget that might be put towards doing archaeological evaluation. Uh, hopefully you can see this, but it, it varied between 0.5% of a large residential scheme to nearly half of the budget for a minerals extraction scheme. Um, in terms of the percentage coverage of any trenching, again, a f quite a wide variety of responses. It ranged from 0.35% to 5% of percentage by area, but averaged out around about 2.5%, and the most common response was 2%. There was very little repetitive data, so I couldn't say much about the patterns between counties, but what we could say was that there was a range of, uh, of percentages being applied. And that's where I'm going to leave percentages um, entirely. Um, so the report that but will follow on from this does contain a discussion of the philosophy I can't say that, behind the use of percentages and a review of all the previous studies that have been carried out um, and also opinions from the various stakeholder groups. However, as I said, the issues that actually came out as being of greatest concern were not about what the percentage was, but about how the reason for getting there was communicated. Um, and the diversity of pro approaches seen across the country was being, is being perceived by some people as not always justified by local conditions and being based on personal preference rather than evidenced reasoning. And whether this is true or not, that just that perception emphasises the need for transparency in the decision-making process. So we return to communication of this process as the key to improving evaluation. And in terms of conclusions, that the, there is cross-sectoral agreement of the key factors that we need to dis consider when evaluating archaeology, the current issues and the potential solutions. It seems that the overriding desire is to see a more easily understood and transparent process for decision making guided by research questions on a site or regional level, and or regional level. Value for money is not automatically seen as being achieved through reducing the scope of work by clients. 
and making things cheaper, but through lowering risk and through a better understanding from their point of view of the significance and impact of what work is coming. And obviously, there's, I think there's um, quite general agreement across the sector that upfront spending can have significant cost advantages over the lifetime of a project. Um, previous studies have provided valuable information, but focus is focusing just on finding the optimum percentage for each type and period of archaeology hasn't been successful. And I think after having gone through this process, I don't think we are going to reach a consensus on um, the use of percentages, as in the number that we need to apply. But we can agree that a tailored approach is needed and that explaining why we've got to that, that point is the key. We need to be able to show our workings and to communicate that well to everybody that's involved in very plain terms. Um, establishing agreement on how proportionality can be effectively assessed is also going to be of benefit. The present situation leaves us at risk of encountering the heritage sector, rather, at risk of encountering a challenge to that that we can't effectively counter, because we don't have a good data set that shows our workings. <laughs> um, at the other end of the process, Introducing feedback mechanisms will increase that evidence base for a whole range of techniques, allow clients to understand their commercial implications and allow us to tailor strategies to individual circumstance. Um, many of the clients involved in the workshops expressed their desire for worst case scenario planning for cost and programme and clar clarity in where the process of evaluation was going to lead them. Um, we already have those mechanisms. Um, they're applied for lots of different kinds of reporting. For example, we have mechanisms within screening for environmental impact assessment. And maybe we need to do a bit more sectoral sharing of the approaches that are taken so that um, we can share our knowledge and share best practices, good practice. Um, if we work towards a consistency of decision making rather than approach, uh, this, this could help provide that transparency that everybody's asking for and a, if you like a lay person's understanding of what the aim of a archaeological evaluation actually is. Groups within the sector also, it would seem, need to work towards a, a providing a clearer understanding of our differing roles and responsibilities and how they fish, fit together within that decision-making process. And one of the things, to end on a positive note from the conclusions, one of the things that came across from, I would say, 80-90% of the client representatives is that they see the value in what we do. They see the public benefit of archaeology. And we need to be more confident, perhaps, in, in presenting that um, directly to them. So, um, the recommendations of the, of the work so far are that we need to, we can achieve improvements through ensuring a widespread understanding of the planning process, communicating this effectively to clients and other stakeholders so that they understand why we're doing evaluation in the first place. The multi-staged evaluation approach is, is unique to archaeology. Other disciplines carrying out surveys, it, it's kind of survey and mitigation. We don't have this several layers of survey, desk-based and otherwise. Um, so we need to explain why we're different. <laughs> um, and our process often takes longer, therefore, than other specialisms that they may be used to dealing with. Um, desk-based assessment guidance needs to consider this, and perhaps we need to look at revising that guidance to include requirements for things like the prediction of the likely program of further work, uh, for in ensuring we're using new technology for prediction, and um, making sure that older technology such as map regression is used as standard. Um, the same is true for terminology. We need to uh, consider how we're using that and making sure that it's clear to our clients. Um, this, so the, the next a uh, stage of work is uh, alongside this in parallel is running a PhD project carried out by uh, uh, Richard Hyam at the University of Brighton, Sussex, Brighton. Um, and he is carrying out a computer modelling which does statistically test percentages. So it'll be interesting to feed that back into this. It, it, it kind of uh, provides the, the numbers to the anecdotal study effectively. So. The recommendations that are coming out of the Evaluations 1 project will be identified with uh, key, key um, people or groups responsible for, for potentially taking them forwards. And they basically boil down to knowledge share, updating guidance, providing training and providing training resources, something that was actually particularly picked up on by the local authority groups, 
I, I think it's been mentioned earlier, is just people sometimes coming into roles where they don't have a, a support structure already in place. So helping them find where they can find advice on what might be applicable in their particular, the particular circumstance. And also ensuring that the people carrying out evaluations are properly aware of, of what they're supposed to achieve. And we agree what they're supposed to achieve. Um, there's a whole suite of, I don't expect you to be able to read that from the back, but there's a whole suite of different um, suggestions to achieve these aims. Basically starting pre-evaluation with ensuring that robust desk-based assessment is carried out and defining what we really mean by that. Uh, aiming to improve communication, standardising decision making, not the results but how we get to the point what we need to consider in agreeing on that. Trying to encourage a better understanding within the heritage sector of what we're trying to achieve through evaluation. And finally, it's a kind of general term, <laughs> ensuring better outputs. And that includes uh, looking at what public benefit is, sharing our knowledge and sharing uh, best practice and good, the good things that we all do but perhaps don't shout about enough. Um, so. The, the study, the, the report is currently in its draft format and is going to the project advisory board to be uh, reviewed. It will then go out for wider consultation. Um, I, I, I want feedback from people. We, we need to know if what, what's come out of this study is useful um, and what we can practically take forwards to, to the next stage of the project. The idea is that the evals two stage will implement some of the suggestions of this, whether that's guidance documents or providing new places to share information or, or anything else that anyone thinks of, basically. So, um, uh, Finally, just to say thank you very much to anybody who did contribute. It's basically this, this couldn't happen without other people providing me their opinions and information. And some people have very much stuck their heads above the parapet in doing that, and I really appreciate it. So thank you very much.